Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Gunn. I'm an M2 at Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences. Um, I'm the current president of People in Healthcare, which is our LGBTQ plus organization here at Toledo. Um, I'm here on behalf of Dr. Jenkins. Um, we'd like to go ahead and introduce you guys to Daniel Lutman. Uh, Daniel Lutman currently serves as the LGBTQ plus A liaison to the diversity, equity, and inclusions, and she's the program manager for gender equity student initiatives at the Everly Center on campus. She's worked in higher education for the past six years and has been training folks on LGBTQA plus issues across campus and across the state of Ohio. So thank you, Danielle, for being here, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thanks, Jenna, and um, hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get um, everything shared. My slideshow should be up um, for you all. Um, I have access to the chat and everything. So if you want to throw questions and, and whatnot in there, um, that would be fantastic. Um, so as Jenna said, my name's Danielle Lutman. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the power, power of allyship affirming trans and non-binary patients. Um, and so I want to just start with um, some terminology. Uh, sometimes I assume that folks um, have the same language and are using the same language, and that's not the case. So um, when we're thinking about an ally, we're thinking about somebody who is actively working um, to be in uh, creating intentional, positive um, spaces, right? It's a conscious effort um, to benefit, benefit folks. Um, so then allyship would be um, also in action um, that's continuous. It's a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals and or groups of people. Um, so this is not just something that's specific to trans and non-binary patients, although that's how we're talking about it today. Um, allyship is not self-defined. So while you're doing work and you know you think that it's fantastic, um, if folks who are in the communities that you're trying to benefit don't share those views, right? Like, one, you should know that because you should be having conversations with them. Um, but they're the ones who who get to to name us as allies. Um, and allyship is an opportunity to grow and learn um, more about ourselves while building um, confidence in others, right? So again, lifelong process. Um, the other two terms that I wanted to just briefly define before we get started um, were transgender, which uh, shortened to trans. Most of um, what you'll hear today um, is that abbreviated trans piece. Um, it's an umbrella term for people whose gender identities differ from the sex they were assigned at birth. And so an umbrella under that umbrella is the non-binary umbrella, um, which is used by some folks who experience their gender identity and or their gender expression is falling outside of the binary of man and woman. So whenever we're thinking about terminology specific to trans and non-binary folks and LGBTQ individuals in general, we want to make sure that we're getting these terms from organizations that identify within those communities. Um, a, a couple of years ago, I was at a camp and um, it was for like queer student leaders and they had a flag that I hadn't seen before and I looked it up on Google, and I should have known like Google was not going to be helpful. Um, yeah, it was not the right definition for the flag. So, right, this is something we just want to be aware of when we're looking up definitions. So, this is a trans umbrella graphic that um, was put out by the Trans Student Equality Resource Group. Um, so it has right trans and transgender. Um, we don't see non-binary on here, right? We see some some of the pieces that are on here: gender queer, gender fluid, agender, multigender, um, are things that we are seeing on this non-binary umbrella, which was put out by a center for gender and sexual diversity out of Canada um, on International Non-Binary People's Day, which is July 14th. If you didn't know that, um, and so if we're thinking about trans and non-binary folks, recognizing that non-binary is under the trans umbrella, but that it's it's its own umbrella. So we want to use the language that folks are using with us, um, which is to say that you can't just call like all 
folks who are trans or non-binary trans, right? We wanna use the language that they're using. So this is a gender and pronoun guide um, that the LGBTQA plus um, initiatives put out, um, goes into a little bit more detail about gender identity, gender expression, and biological sex with those terms. Um, just throwing it in here so y'all know about it. Um, also kind of talking about pronouns. So if you um, need to visualize what the pronouns um, are and what they might look like in the different tenses, right? Subjective, objective, and possessive, um, that's on there for y'all. But pronouns are just how we refer to folks um, in the third person when we're not using their name. Um, the other piece that I wanted to briefly touch on um, is the standard model of care versus the informed consent model. Um, the standard model of care was actually created in 1966 by Harry Benjamin. So it's pretty old. Um, it's changed a little bit uh, in terms of it's it's not as rigid as it used to be. Um, it is what's currently recommended by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health S Standards of Care, um, but it does require a mental health diagnosis of gender dysphoria for any gender affirming medical care. So that includes hormones, um, it includes um, any types of surgeries, um, anything like that. So a lot of trans folks um, prefer informed consent, which um, the personal autonomy of the patient is prioritized. Mental health professionals are not required, but it is encouraged. So it's not like a, you know, you don't need that. It's, um, hey, this is a great resource for you. You should take advantage of therapy, um, but they don't need that that diagnosis of gender dysphoria um, or set amounts of time um, to be able to, to receive care. So um, I know that in Ohio, we don't have a state law that um, determines which model of care folks are using. Um, and there are places that use um, one or the other. So I. I believe the closest place to us in Ohio that uses informed consent for trans and non-binary care is Equitas, um, but I, you know, could be wrong. Um, also wanted to just touch on Ohio Health, Ohio's healthcare laws and policies. So this information is brought to us by the Movement Advancement Project, um, and we can see that Ohio is not great for um, for folks in the LGBTQ community, um, trans and non-binary folks would fall under the gender identity um, category where we see only one positive thing in here and that is the data collection of LGBTQ um, adults. So when we're taking data from adults, we're, we're asking about gender identity, but there are no laws in terms of health care, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, health insurance, um, whether that's private or state Medicaid, um, and then we actually have um, negative laws on the books where um, trans folks, um, and again, that's as an umbrella, so including non-binary folks, um, their health benefits um, for state employees, as well as our Medicaid policy are negative laws. So they're, they're completely um, denying folks that. Um, also wanted to just highlight the um, Ohio does criminalize exposure to and or Transmission of HIV, um, which is a negative law that um, disproportionately impacts um, queer folks. So, you know, thinking about our health insurance laws and things like that, um, I did not realize this was a um, we would be in presentation mode. So, I assumed folks would be able to, you know, chat um, with me, but. Uh, medical professionals in Ohio, if you did not know, can deny LGBTQA plus folks care. Um, this is actually very, very recent. So on June 30th, um, Governor DeWine signed our newest Ohio state budget. And part of that included a medical refusal provision that allows healthcare professionals, hospitals, and health insurance companies to refuse to provide or to pay for uh, medical services based on uh, moral, ethical, or religious obligations, which, um, right, there is no kind of proof that's needed for any of that. So folks can just say like, nope, that's against my personal beliefs um, to, to treat folks. Um, this is really, really important to, to know 
um, because 60% of trans folks that are denied medical care attempt suicide, right? So it's not just like, oh, well, you know, this is some arbitrary thing. Um, this happens. It's been happening since before this was um, something in Ohio. Um, the largest uh, study that was done that included healthcare questions was done in 2010. So it's a little bit dated. Um, but it was done by the National Center for Transgender Equality and the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Um, it was not solely about healthcare. It did include other things, but part of it was healthcare. And so um, what you're seeing on the screen is um, the the folks who said they were refused care um, based on race and based on gender identity. So we can see that this is not just um, this is not just something that's like impacted by um, gender identity specifically, right? Like there are other things at, at play, right? Intersectionality is, is a thing. Um, and so 19% of the sample, I mean, that is a large number, but it, it might not seem like it. So there were over 7,000 people that responded to that survey in 2010 um, and 19% of 7,000 is 1,330 people. Um, and again, this was back in 2010, so there are even more trans folks and non-binary folks who have been denied care um, since then, which is like wild to me, right? Um, that over a thousand people um, were just denied care from their from a medical professional. So let's see if this is going to work. Um, this video was done from um, at the University of Michigan um, with adolescent trans folks um, talking about their experiences in healthcare. And so, again, I think it's just important to get us in the mindset of like why allyship is important. Hey Danielle, I can't hear the video. I just want to let you know. Thank you. That was Jenna. Um, okay, so I will, I'll just link this um, and I'll send it out um, to James and he can send it to those of y'all who are registered and we can link it in the, um, in the recording. I know from experience that it's not worth the time to try and figure out um, technological things during during the presentation. So apologies for, for that 30 seconds of silence um, and I will get you all the link to that. Let's, there we go. Um, so, some of the, the things that folks were talking about in the video um, are on this slide, um, which I wasn't planning on reading, but since the video didn't work, um, this is from a study done by the National Center for Transgender Equality in 2015. Um, and in the video, we would have heard some of the folks talking about some of these things. So having to teach their healthcare provider about trans folks in order to get appropriate care. Um, having their healthcare provider ask them unnecessary or invasive invasive questions that were not related to the reason of their visit, um, being verbally harassed in the healthcare setting, um, being physically abused, um, having harsh language, right? Um, so all of these things are just really terrible to even like imagine experiencing outside of a healthcare setting, but like specifically in a healthcare setting, right? Um, and all of these things really lead to um, trans folks either delaying care or not getting care at all, right? Um, and all LGBTQ folks, but again, we're, we're talking specifically about trans and non-binary folks today. So 
when we're thinking about affirming care, um, our most important piece is going to be our language. So we want to make sure that we're using the language that our patients are using. Um, this refers to their um, their identity, right? Um, their name, their pronouns. Um, again, if they identify as a gender, right? Like we don't want to start referring to them as trans. Like they've told us their identity, we're going to use that. Um, but this also refers to their sexual orientation. So if you're in a space where um, you're a primary care physician or, um, right, if your patient is seeing you about something that has to do with um, any kind of sexual activity with other folks, right, um, it is important to understand who your patients are um, engaging in sexual activity with. And so, again, making sure that we're using the language um, if somebody says that they sleep with men, right, we don't want to label them gay. Uh, so just thinking about all of that, um, specifically with trans and non-binary folks, we want to use the language that they're using for their bodies and their genitals. And so, you know, having a conversation before you engage in um, kind of the, the pre-exam questions or even the exam, right, of um, you know, these are the areas that we're going to be talking about. How would you like me to to refer to those for you? Um, a lot of folks, right, um, in the trans and non-binary community aren't going to use the medical terms that, you know, we've, that you all have learned, um, the terms that, you know, we've kind of grew up with, penis, vagina, vulva, clitoris, right, um, anus, prostate, they might not be using that language because a lot of it is gendered. And so that's going to um, be something to think about. Um, and then, of course, using the names and pronouns that your patients use, um, regardless of whether that has been a legal name change or not. Um, this is really important. Um, making sure that right billing is obviously like its own thing, um, but once they check in, right, we can we can use their names. Um, some more language pieces, we wanna avoid saying um, born female or born male. Um, we wanna instead say assigned female or male. The body language is often interpreted as an invalidation of, of one's gender identity. So um, it could just be, right, a lot of times our language um, is unintentionally um, harmful. Um, and so this is just to kind of share a little bit um, and expand our knowledge because again, allyship is, um, is a lifelong process. Um, and then anything that's gonna kind of play into the binary of there being two genders only, right? So both opposite, um, we wanna instead say all, some, some, just one more slide about language. Um, we want to make sure that we're using affirming language, right? This is the power of allyship, affirming trans and non-binary patients. And so, um, affirmation looks like asking folks what their pronouns are, um, how they want to be, um, referred to what they want their body parts to be referred to as, right? Um, it's also using gender inclusive language. So talking about partners or parents or children, um, instead of assuming the gender of somebody's partner, parent, or child, right? Um, also, there are so many other, um, a lot of our language is gendered. So um, really thinking about how we're, we're being inclusive with our language. Um, Y'all is one of my favorite words, uh, and I, you know, recently started saying it, like, within the past 10 years, and it was in order to, you know, stop calling everybody guys, uh, because that's a gendered greeting that we, we do very often, right? Um, some language that we for sure want to stay away from, um, condition, so this is one that's, like, more specific to medical field, so I uh, wanted to make sure that this one was first. Um, it's right, like anything that you're talking to a trans or non-binary patient about in terms of their identity is not a condition, right? Um, we assume pronouns, I want to use the word preference, lifestyle, 
um, change or reassignment or behavior. So these are all words um, that have been used in the past, but have neg negative connotations with them. So again, we want to stay away from those. Um, so moving into um, some tips, right, uh, for improving the services for trans and non-binary folks. Um, this was put out by the Transgender Law Center um, in 2016. Uh, so this is linked at the end of the presentation. Um, we want to make sure that your outreach is inclusive, right? So that you're one, like letting people know that that your services are available to them, right? Um, people shouldn't have to call and say like, hey, do you serve trans people? Um, hey, do you do this, right? Like make it really clear in your outreach um, that you are inclusive to trans and non-binary folks. Um, and then also making sure that you have um, trans positive cues in your office, right? So if you have posters of um, people, right? Make, making sure that those folks don't all um, conform to like gender stereotypes, right? Um, and a lot of times those images are stock images. And so, right, like it might take a little bit more work for um, either your office or your marketing department, right, um, to do that, but it's gonna be really important for folks. If they don't see themselves in, in, your, in your office or your space, um, they might not come back, right? Um, we wanna make sure that we're treating um, trans and non-binary folks with respect. Um, the list actually says to treat people how you want to be treated, um, but I am more of a platinum rule than the golden rule person, um, which means that we ask folks how they want to be treated and treat them that way. Um, with respect. And so what does that look like in a healthcare setting, right? Um, it's you being relaxed, right? Um, if you're on edge about interacting with a trans person, like they're going to be able to know, right? We have all been in situations where we're like, wow, this person's super uncomfortable, like just being in this space with me. And that's not a great feeling. Um, so being relaxed, being courteous, um, and then making sure that we're like talking directly to the folks, um, making eye contact and not, um, not right, like talking off to the side or like not looking up um, if if there's somebody with the with the trans or non-binary person, right? Like, um, we're not talking to that person because, right? Like, they make us feel more comfortable. Um, so a lot of this also has to do with us kind of figuring out our our biases beforehand, so that we can um, we can interact with with people with respect, right? So. Our voice is going to change. All there's all these ways that we can tell when folks are uncomfortable, um, and and people notice, right? So like, figuring out that for yourself before you're in the, in a room with a trans or non-binary person is going to be really really important. Um, you know, we already talked about names and pronouns. Um, if you're unsure about their pronouns or their gender identity, ask politely. Um, only if it pronouns, of course, but like their gender identity, only if it matters, right? Like if they're, they're getting, um, like a strep test or something, right? Like you don't need to know how they identify their gender. Um, so making sure that, right, like we're asking politely, um, and that could just look like, Hey, what pronouns do you use? How, how do you identify in terms of your gender? Right? Um, it's, for sure, not like, are you a boy? Are you a girl? Right? Um, which is in the binary, and I said not to do, but honestly, the question that trans and non binary folks get so much, right? Is like, well, which box do you fit in? Um, and we don't want to do that. We also want to make sure that we have an effective policy for addressing discrimination if it happens in your office or your space, right? So um, if a trans or non binary person is in your space and they um, experience discrimination and they tell you about it, right? Um, the next time they come, if it happens again, they're going to know that like nothing happened, right? And so it doesn't necessarily mean that that folks are being fired or right, like anything like that, but having some type of policy in place or procedure, right? Um, 
that says like, okay, if this happens, like we're going to have a conversation and then there's going to be some training and there's an expectation that, um, right. That you're doing education for yourself outside of these spaces. Um, and then if it happens again, right, then we can maybe like, maybe the policy is like, okay, the first time was a, uh, a verbal warning. Now it's a written warning. Now you're on probation. Right. Um, and that might seem drastic to folks, but, um, it's, I mean, again, these are, these are people and it's their livelihood that we're, we're thinking about. So, um, right. Just like any other kind of indiscretion that somebody would have, right. If they violated HIPAA, what does that policy look like? Um, so kind of just thinking about all of the, the ways, um, that we can institutionally support folks. Um, we want to make sure that we're focusing on care instead of curiosity. And so, again, if somebody is there for a um, to fix their broken arm and to, to take an x-ray of their arm, we're not there to ask about anything that really has to do with their gender identity, right? Um, we want to be really careful about um, like not using trans and non-binary patients as training opportunities um, for other folks, but also for ourselves, right? So if we remember back um, to how folks were interacting with healthcare providers, um, it was like 24, 25% of people had to um, educate their provider, right? Like that's also um, somebody viewing a trans or non-binary patient as a training opportunity, right, for themselves. Um, we definitely don't ask questions about their genitals unless it's directly related to their care, right? Um, we don't want to disclose that a person is trans or non-binary um, to anybody else in that office, in your practice, right, um, who doesn't need to know. And so if, um, if I checked in um, to registration, right, um, and I came back and I, and I, was having a conversation with you and I, I told you that I was non-binary, there would be no reason for, for you to let the registration folks know that like, oh, we had a non-binary patient today and like Danielle was the patient, right? Um, so being really careful with not outing folks um, and then keep learning about trans healthcare issues. So again, we, we are reminded that this is a lifelong process. Um, this these tips are in terms of creating an affirming environment. Um, and so I apologize, I um, missed my um, reference on the bottom, um, but this is also on my work cited page. Um, so we want to make sure that we are um, asking folks about pronouns. Right, their gender identity, their sexual orientation, their um, anything instead of telling them or assuming, right? Um, so again, if somebody tells you that you know they identify as um, as bi gender, right? Like we're not then calling them non-binary or trans. Like we're using the language that they're using. We've asked what what they're using. Um, we want to be respectfully clinically curious. Um, I added clinically in here. That was not part of the eight tips that, um, that were given, but we're only being curious if it has to do with their care. Right. And so, um, and when we're, yeah, we're asking those questions that, um, are just invasive in and of itself, right? Like. I think all of us have been to the doctor and, and had conversations where like, oh, this is very uncomfortable, right? Um, that doctor is being respectful in that conversation, which is what makes it tolerable. So if you do have to be curious in, with your questions, right, um, making sure that we're being respectful, but also making sure that we're not just being curious because it's our curiosity, right? It has something to do with their care. Um, names and pronouns matter, you know, We've seen this on a couple different lists at this point, uh, making sure that we're doing our own research. And so that doesn't mean that you're running research projects, um, but that does mean that you're working to educate yourself, right? That when you go to a conference or um, you are, you know, deciding what 
book you want to read in your specialty next, right? You're you're intentionally thinking about trans and non-binary folks, um, knowing that intersectionality is is critical, right? Like trans and non-binary folks have more identities than just their gender identity. And so um, understanding how all of those interact with each other. Um, if we think back to um, the 2015 survey that was done by the um, National Center for Transgender Quality, I'm definitely botching that name. Um, we remember that although 19% of trans folks had been denied care, right? Um, there was a difference uh, based on their race, right? With um, indigenous folks having the highest number um, of that. So, right, intersectionality is important. Um, letting your office speak for you. So we talked a little bit about this, right? In terms of your display. Also making sure you have, you know, a, a non-gendered bathroom, right? So it's not just, here's the men's, here's the women's restroom. Um, there are a couple different um, terms that folks use right on uh, the campus of the University of Toledo. We use gender neutral. Um, it could be a uh, just a universal bathroom, right? So there's lots of different language that folks use, um, but having making sure that your space is accessible to, to folks is important, right? This also includes um, any type of registration documents, right? Um, or forms that people are filling out. Um, if we're asking about um, gender identity, right? Best practice is just to let folks write it in. I know that that's not always possible with uh, medical systems specifically, um, right? With like the intake, um, but giving folks as many options as possible um, is important. Um, if you are asking about sex assigned at birth, using the terminology sex assigned at birth, um, making sure that, right, your whole team, everybody in the office um, is, is working towards creating an affirming environment, right? Because you could be the most trans-friendly doctor in the nation. And if you work somewhere, right, where there's one person who, um, right, is like scoffing at folks, like folks aren't that's not an affirming environment, right? Um, so making sure that it's everybody uh, on your team is on board um, and is working. And then to remember that ally is a verb. And so, you know, um, kind of wrapping, starting to wrap up here, um, leaving lots of time for Q&A, which, um, yeah, well, we can. And conscious efforts that benefit folks as a whole. Um, allyship is a lifelong process, right? Um, it's not self-defined and it's an opportunity to continue growing and learning. Um, so that being said, um, I am not a healthcare professional, right? Um, you heard from um, Jenna's introduction of me that I work um, in student affairs. Um, I am the LGBTQ A plus liaison. Um, and I'm also a program manager for a gender equity student initiative. So not a medical professional, not a healthcare professional. Um, there are a lot of great things out there. And so, um, you know, one of the pieces that was mentioned um, was the standards of care. If you are unfamiliar with what that looks like, um, I encourage you to read it, right? The Gay and Lesbian Medical Association has um, some guidelines published um, there is a national LGBTQIA plus health center um, that has continuous programs, resources, um, like virtual and in person. Um, so they're a great resource. And then also look into ha what's happening in your field or your specialization. So there's going to be, um, right, um, there's probably separate conferences for LGBTQ um, care and trans care. So um, go to a conference, but if you can't go to one that's specific, um, look for sessions that are, are happening around that. Um, my works cited page, and then that is it. 